Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, and we're delighted to have Sebastian Bubek from Princeton tell us about two basic problems in finite stochastic optimization. Thank you, Yuvan. Um, okay, so I think I, I prepared way too much. Uh, but So maybe it will be only one basic problem <laughs> in, in stochastic optimization. We'll see. So feel free to uh, interrupt me if anything is not clear. So I'm going to start with, and maybe only talk about that, um, but I'm going to start with roughly my favorite problem um, in research. So this is this problem. So you have k unknown probability distributions, which are sub-Gaussians. So unknown k unknown probability, which are sub-Gaussian, with variance proxy bounded by 1 or something like that. And what you want is to find the distribution which has the maximal mean. So the goal is to find the one that has the maximal mean, so the argmax of mu i, where mu i is defined as the expectation of x when x is drawn from mu i. And you want the argmax between 1 and k. Let's call this i star, and I'm going to assume that it's unique. Okay, so my goal is to find i star. And so, okay, so now I need to tell you how do I interact uh, with, with this probability distribution. So what I can do is I have a budget of n samples. So I can sequentially query the, query the probability distribution and I get, re I get realization from this probability distribution. So I want to find I star using n observations. which are sequentially chosen. So more precisely, so a little bit more formally, we have a sort of sequential game. So the time is going to go from 1, 2, up to n. And at each time step, what do I do? I choose it, which is in 1 to k. So I choose an index. I choose one of these probability distribution. And what I receive is, so choose it. And I receive a realization, so I receive yt, which is drawn from new it. And this drawing is uh, independent of everything else, conditionally on it. Okay. Once I have done these n samples, at the end, what I want is to output one of the probability distributions. So I output jn, which is in k. And my hope is that Jn is going to be I star, the best one. Okay? And how am I evaluated? I'm evaluated by what is the mean of this guy compared to the true best mean. Okay? So my, my regret, so the regret at time n is the difference between mu I star, so the best mean that I could have obtained, and I compare it to mu Jn, which is the mean of of the, the selected probability distribution. So I'm going to call this k probability distribution, I'm going to call them arms. Okay? So that's my, the terminology that I use from the multi-arm bandit uh, terminology. And I put an expectation here. So this is what I call the simple regret. So it's just my optimization error. right? I want to optimize this mu i, and instead of the max, I got this guy, and I look at the distance. And I want this thing to be as small as possible. Okay. If you if you know about tra yes. So when you go and you inspect this guy one by one, yeah. Then you will select that guy. So you have the option to select this guy, or you can just don't select it and go to the next guy. Is this the so process? this you have total freedom when you choose it in one two k, yeah. right? This this choice is going to be dependent on all the previous observations that you made. Yeah. I don't know. Imagine I made plenty of, of trials, and now I'm going to choose to observe probability distribution number 3. Yeah. And at the next time step, I choose to observe probability distribution number 10. Yeah. And then you can, can you return to the one? I can return. I can do anything I want. So, so, uh, 
But you have to return to the same things. Absolutely. Like so I will need to try, so to estimate the mean of M1, for instance, I will need to try it many, many times, right, to have a, an estimate, an accurate estimate. Because the first time I try it, imagine this is a Bernoulli distribution with parameter of mu1. I, I try it, I get a 1. I try it a second time, I get you a 0. I want to learn it. I want to learn, I, essentially, I want to learn the mu star, right? OK, so that's what I want to do. Uh, so I'm not really the first one to look at this problem. Uh, as you can expect, I mean, this is as basic as it gets, right? I just want to find the, the max of k uh, finite things. Um, but the issue is that roughly there has been two approaches, which are minimax and Bayesian. Because what I want, I want to find the optimal, in some sense, allocation strategy. I want to find the best allocation strategy so as to minimize this simple regret. But this problem is not well defined a priori. Right? There is an optimal allocation strategy. If, if I know the new, the new eyes, I do whatever I want, but at the end I output the best guy. OK, this is optimal. Um, now, in Minimax, what you say is that you, take a, you, you design your allocation strategy, and then I can choose which set of probability distribution I'm going to throw at you, and I look at what is the, your regret in that case. That's Minimax. Then best is well defined. Okay? It's a mean of a max. There's some normalization. There's no normalization. So there is no normalization. There is no normalization here. So this, this Right. So in, in a minimax sense, the answer is that Rn, the optimal Rn, is of order square root of uh, k over n. That's the best you can do, and that's not very difficult to prove, and I think that's totally uninteresting. So a trivial strategy will get you k log k over n or k log n, but you, you have to work a little bit to remove the log, but that's really not the point. We'll see that you can gain order of magnitudes with a new point of view. What does it mean, sub-Gaussian? What, what does it mean, what? Sub-Gaussian, when you say? Oh, sub-Gaussian, it just means the usual thing. Uh, so, I guess it, that's the normalization now. Right. So, <coughs> so, does that have the constant? So, which sub Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, sub-Gaussian with constant 1, or with known constant. Okay. So, that's, because that's you the term sub-Gaussian can be used. No, absolutely. So, right. sub-Gaussian, I, I said it quickly, I said so with. The proxy for the variance is bounded by one. Okay, so that is this yeah, it's not the main point. Imagine everything is Gaussian with variance one, and and the talk makes sense, and is non-trivial. So, so minimax that gives you this. Okay, so this has been studied uh, since the fifties, etc. Bayesian, what you do is that you put a prior <laughs> over possible parameters for the probability distribution, and then you want to find the Allocation strategy that minimizes the expected simple regret, where the expectation is with respect to the draw from the prior. Okay, so this is also well defined, but then you have to come up with a prior, etc., and it, it's not it's not clear how to do it. So I want to go beyond these things, and I will propose a, a new uh, sort of a new perspective, which allows you to talk about. Uh, optimal strategies with, without making an assumption such as minimax or Bayesian. Okay, I will come back to this. So for those of you who know about multi arm bandits, this feels like a multi arm bandit problem, except that the performance measure is different. So in, in bandits, what we look at is this capital Rn, which is a cumulative regret. So we look at the sum of the simple instantaneous regret at every time step. Okay, so we look at the sum for t equals 1 to n. So at every time step, we could have played the optimal arm. We would have gotten mu i star. But instead, we played i t, so we got mu i t. And I'm going to look at this in expectation. So that's called the cumulative regret. Right. And a trivial, a trivial thing is that the simple regret is upper bounded by the cumulative regret divided by n, right? What I can do is that at the end, when, when you ask me to output something, I can just select a time step at random, output the actions that I played at that time, and that gives me this bound. 
Okay, so this is always true. And this gets you the minimax rate. But now I'm going to show that you can get much better. So, okay, yes. You take expectation uh, with respect, respect to IT? Yes. I I, so it's expectation with respect to everything. So it's with respect to IT. So IT could be randomized. But even if it's deterministic, it depends on the previous observations, which are themselves random. So I take expectation with, it's, it's, it's a complicated expectation. It's not, I mean, it's simple, but to analyze, it's not obvious how to do it. Inspect this guy. Then, I mean, how many you want to select from them? Just the maximum of them you want to select? Right. That's exactly what I'm going to talk about. How, how do you do this, right? What, what is the allocation strategy? How do you choose this guy? So let's. You don't choose bottoms. You may choose several times. You choose like one at a time, but yeah. you will make n selections. Make n selections. Oh, n and n is given to you. n is given to you. n is given to you. Because so with arbitrary large, probably you can find the. Yes, uh, but the question is you want the optimal rate. You want to make the most out of it. Like with n, you will see. So let me, let me show you one trivial thing so that we are all on the same page. So what is trivial is just you have, you have a budget of n samples. You have k options, so you just allocate n over k to each arm. Right? So you just try each option n over k times. So what, what does it give you? So one thing is that to simplify for the talk, I'm going to look at this thing, which is, so the regret, let's say if every, all the means are in, in constant, this is certainly smaller than En, which is the error rate, which is the probability that Jn is not equal to I star. Okay, let's say that all, all the mu i's, they live in the interval 0, 1, for instance, okay? I'm going to denote, it's going to be important for the rest of the talk. Delta i is mu star, mu i star minus mu i. So delta i is the suboptimality gap. It's the distance between the quality of i and the, quality, the best quality that you can get. So this is certainly larger also than delta times en, where delta is the smallest gap. Delta is the mean of the delta i's of i not equal to i star. Right, so in first order approximation, it's fine to focus on EN, the error rate. Okay, so I'm, most of the talk, I'm going to talk about the error rate rather than the simple regret. So let's see what is the error rate of this simple thing. So you just apply Chernoff, right? So the deviation, deviating by epsilon is going to be bounded by exponential minus T times epsilon squared. If I sample T times someone, what I need is that everybody stays in an interval of size roughly delta i. If this is the case, then there is no way that at the end I output somebody else than the best guy. Right? If everybody is in an interval of size delta i, then I, I get the best thing. So, right? so I have mu i. If it stays within, let's say, one half of delta i, if the empirical, so I'm going to denote by mu hat i, so that's my empirical estimate using my samples. If the empirical estimate stays within an interval of size one half delta i for every i, then at the end I just look at the best one and, and I will get the true best. Okay? So what does this give me? So with an union bound, we just get the sum for i equals one to k exponential minus n over k, that's the number of samples that I get, times delta i squared. That's the deviation that I'm looking at and a constant, okay? So let me, so two comments on this. The first one is that this goes exponentially fast to zero, okay? So the probability of, of making a mistake goes exponentially fast to zero. Um, and this is going to be small roughly when, so this is going to be dominated by the largest of these terms. The largest of these terms happens when I look at i, which minimizes the gaps. So this is small, this is small when n over k times delta is large, when n k delta squared is large. So it's smaller than delta if this is larger than log one over delta. 
So what we need, so it's small when n is at least omega of k over delta squared. So if the number of samples, the number of trials that I can make, the number of experiments, is at least k over delta squared, just uniform allocation will find the best action. You want another log k? Right. I want an another log k. I absolutely want another log k. So I want, let's say, if, if, if this is log k over delta, then with probability at least 1 minus delta, I find it. Because that's precisely what I get. OK, so, so is this good? Is this, is this result good? So clearly, it, it doesn't feel very good because you spend, I mean, you try everybody, but it could be that very early on, you identify that some of these guys, they are not competitors, right? They will, there is almost no chance that these guys will be the best one. But still, you keep them. So what you want, maybe, is to focus your attention on the guys which look difficult to distinguish. OK? So, okay. so what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to show you uh, uh, first what are the limits of these problems. So here we said that if n is that large, we can find it. Now, how, how large, need, I mean, if n is smaller than something, you also can't find it. So this, is a, this was the main theorem that we did in, back in 2010 with Jean-Yves Audibert, myself, and Rémi Munoz. And this, is really, this theorem is really what gives this new point of view, which is neither minimax nor Bayesian. So it goes as follows. So for any new, so new is a, is a product of the new i's. And I'm going to look at a new, which is just a Gaussian distribution. So it's going to be a lower bound. So I, if I restrict to Gaussian distributions, that's fine. So it's, it's a Gaussian distribution with mean mu and with covariance, the identity in dimension k. Right? So it's just a product of n mu i 1. For any algorithm, so in particular, this for any for any means that this algorithm can depend on mu. Maybe we know mu. I'm going to say that there exists sigma, which is a permutation of the indices, such that if I look at the probability of error of this algorithm on new sigma, so new sigma, which means that I have just permuted the distribution. Okay, so now, instead of having mean mu i on arm i, I have mean mu, mu sigma i on arm i. This is larger than some constant times exponential minus some other constant times n over what we called h. And you have a log k, where h is the sum of the inverse gap squared. The sum of 1 over delta i squared, i not equal to i star. So what this means is that to be small, to have this thing smaller, so this is equivalent to saying that en uh, smaller than delta must imply that n is larger than h some constant over log k. So if, if, you have, if you find, if your probability of error is smaller than delta, sorry, and you have a log 1 over delta. If you have a small probability of error, then it means that the number of samples that you have must be larger than the complexity. We call it h is the hardness of the problem. h divided by log k. And h is the sum of 1 over delta i squared. So now if you compare this to this result downstairs, you see that here, instead of h, I have k over delta squared. But k over delta squared can be much bigger than h, right? So potentially, for some mu, h could be much smaller than k over delta squared. In the worst case, they are the same, right? 
And that's why the minimax analysis is not interesting because in the minimax analysis, the worst case is basically when h is equal to k over delta squared. And in that case, uniform is almost optimal, uniform allocation. So this, this is a result that goes beyond that, right? It's, it's distribution dependent. It depends on the distribution, and it tells you that this is the right measure of hardness of the, I mean, not yet, but yes, yes so far. But at the end of the day, EN is just a proxy to the simple regret. Absolutely. So if all the arms are the same, this will be terrible, but simple regret could be easy. Absolutely. So this is, yes, that's definitely correct. So this is only a first step, right? So it's, I mean, step by step, right? So it's, here this tells us something very precise about EN. But it's not very precise for RN, I mean, for little RN, for the simple regret. It's, it's, it's an approximation only for the simple regret. This is, not, this is not the end of the story. This is the end of the story, I think, for the error rate, but not for the simple regret, I agree. I don't know what is the full answer for the simple regret. And, uh, I think the classical line Robin's result, right? So Absolutely. So it's exactly along the lines of the classical lion Robin's result. The cumulative regret, uh, it, yeah, absolutely. So it's exact. It's, in some sense, the way to understand it is that it's, for those of, of you who know what is the Lyon Robbins result, it's exactly the version of Lyon Robbins for the uh, simple regret rather than the cumulative regret. Now, the proof techniques are completely different. So now I know how to prove this for the cumulative regret. So let me just spend two minutes on, on this. So I know how to prove this theorem for the cumulative regret now. But Lyon Robbins is not that, right? Lyon Robbins, they have to assume something about the algorithm. Lyon Robbins, they prove a law bound for the cumulative regret, but they say that the algorithm has to be consistent for any possible distribution. No matter what, what is the distribution, you have to be consistent and go at a certain rate. Here, I need to assume nothing about the algorithm. It could be terrible for some distributions. It just And actually, Lyon Robbins, in that sense, is not true. You, you can get. You can get constant regret if you know, if you know the distribution up to a permutation. So it's similar, but it's not the same. Exactly. So now this is not the end of the story, right? Now I need to tell you, can you get this h, right? So you can almost. Um, so you can almost, and this is a strategy which is basically just writing down mathematically what, what the intuition was, which is you try a little bit everybody's and there is one guy which looks clearly is not going to be the best, well then just stop stamping it and then focus on the rest and, and so on and, and so forth. So this is a successive reject. So successive rejects work like this. So it's going to go by phases. So you have phase uh, k equals 1 up to k minus 1. And it will have a set of active arms. So at the beginning, a is everything. And during a phase, you sample uh, nk minus nk minus 1 times everyone in a. So I need to tell you. Uh, I will tell you what there are formulas for this thing. So all the arms that are still active, you sample them a certain number of times, and then remove from A the worst guy. The worst guy. So you do that, um, and at the end, at the end of k minus one, you are left with only one winner, and you say, okay, this is the guy that I believe to be the best. And the theorem is that with nk, which is some formula, so nk is proportional to n over capital K minus 1 uh, plus 1 minus little k, you get that the priority of error is bounded by a constant, so actually k times exponential minus n over h times log squared So, so this strategy, so this means that n 
needs to be of order h times log cube. Okay. It's the number of arms, the number of actions. Little k is a, an index in, in, in the algorithm, right? I go by phases, and in phase little k, that's how many times I sample. It's just a formula that comes out of the analysis. So if you compare to, to the lower bound over there, the lower bound was that you need at least h over log k. And here you need, uh, right, you, you need, you need uh, so if you have more than this, you are smaller than delta, OK? So it's tight up to the logs. So this was in, in, in 2010. Um, now, in just recently, there has been a very, very nice work from uh, um, a group of people, I think, at, at Yahoo. And what they did, so, so this is uh, Karin. Uh, Tomer, Koren, and Sommer in ICML 2013. They can get down to, so they get, so they modify successive reject. It's still the overall same idea. And they get h times log k times log log k. But it's roughly still the same idea, but it's, the analysis is a little bit different. Uh, I'm not going to explain in details. So we still have a gap, but I can also improve the lower bound. I can remove this log k. So except that it's not so easy to remove it. So, so this proof is difficult. Uh, there it's, it, this proof is the only, only thing which is difficult, which I've written on the board so far. Um, and, and you cannot really go into the proof and and try to trick some things. I mean, everything is really, it's tightly together. But I can modify a little bit the assumption and get a much simpler proof. So may maybe this has some value because, I mean, the, the statement is, in a sense, less powerful. But the proof technique is so much simpler that it could be applied to other settings. That's what I want to talk about now. So this is a CRM uh, to be written with uh, Emily Kaufman, so let's put a 14. Um, so the theorem goes as follows. So for any mu, for any nu, which is again an n mu i k, and for any algorithm, so the beginning is the same, now the invariance is not going to be over permutations, because that's what makes this proof difficult, is that you, there is not much you can work with. Right, you have to permute this guy, and if this guy is not nice, you can be in trouble. Um, now what I'm going to do is that instead of looking at permutations, I'm going to take one of the suboptimal arm, and maybe this guy I will pull it up. So I'm going to define let phi i of mu. So that's a vector in Rd, such that phi i of mu let's say the j's component is equal to mu j if i is not e if j is not equal to i and it's equal to mu j plus 2 delta so mu i let's say plus 2 delta i if j equals i so i have i have my vector mu right and i have this operator phi i it takes the i's coordinate and just pull it up to be the best one Right? So the first thing to observe is that the hardness measure, so note that h on mu, so the hardness of mu, is always larger than the hardness of phi i of mu. Right? I can only make the problem simpler by doing that. Because when I pull this guy up, then everybody is further away from the best arm than it was previously. Right? The distance. So in mu, you have a certain distance to the best guy. But in phi i of mu, the best guy becomes the ice one, which is above the, the, the best before. So, so the gap increases. So the hardness measure is decreasing by this operation. 
And what I can show is that there exists, so for any new and for any algorithm, there exists i such that the regret, so the simple regret on phi i of mu is lower bounded by exponential minus a constant times n over h. Right, so, so this gets rid of this log k over there. And, and this proof is five lines, let's say maybe even four lines, uh, compared to four pages here. Um, now, it's weaker, right, because I mean, it's weak. It's, in a sense, it's weaker because the algorithm has... It's hard to say if it's weaker or stronger because here the class over which we take the maximum is a class of size factorial k, right? Here it's only a class of size k. Sorry, I put rd, but it was rk. But anyway, so, so now we know, we know the result up to a log k, right? The lower bound is h, exactly h. And the upper bound is h log k log log k. I think the truth is h, perhaps up to a log log for other reasons. Um, and this is really a fundamental problem. And we only know basically one algorithm, which is this. Everything else is a variant. So that's analysis for this algorithm as well? This one, it's a variant. It's not this algorithm. So instead of having, for instance, instead of having k phases, they have log k phases. So it's, but, but it's still the same structure. And I think you need to get rid of the logs, you need something much smoother. Like you don't need to be tied to a schedule that you had beforehand. Like the schedule should be adaptive. But we don't know how to analyze this. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. With the log k steps, they remove half every every time. Yeah, so that's the algorithm. Yeah. Now I said it. No, because no, I think very far from it, but it's not, it's not clear. So multiplicative weights are typically designed for the minimax rate. They are not adaptive in this sense. Like that's their great weakness is that they work with almost no assumption, but if it turns out that the world is much nicer, then they don't adapt. And here it's really about trying to adapt as much as possible. Right? We even want to adapt as much as if we knew exactly the muse. So, what about the muse? Uh, right. So UCB, uh, there is a, a 20 minute story. So let me try to do it in two minutes. So UCB, you can, pro you can probably show that it cannot go at an exponential rate. So the probability of error will be polynomial. Now you can do a modification of UCB, which, is, which actually goes at this rate. But the modification, so UCB, it looks like it plays at time step t the, the action that maximizes the current mean plus square root of 2 log t over t i t. So this you can show that this is not going to work. What you can do is a modification, which is called UCB e which we did also in 2010, which goes like this, a constant per square root, and you replace the 2 log t by n over h, over t i t. So you need to know h. So if you know h and you do this algorithm, then you get exactly at this rate. Okay. But not knowing h, you could try to adapt to it online, but we don't know how to prove anything about it. But now let me say something from a practical point of view. In practice, these problems, coming back to one of your earlier questions, these problems are only interesting in the range where n is of order h. If n is much, much larger than h, anything will find the best action. Like just do uniform and you will find it. What is interesting is that when you are in a problem where it's hard, like it's just, just at where this is close to a constant. But if this is close to a constant, I mean 2 log t is also a constant. So you can view the analysis of this as an analysis of the true UCB for the cases where n is of order h. So this is showing that the basic UCB should work in some sense. So um, now let me just quickly show you some 
pictures. So can I get the thing down? Thanks. Um, yes. What if, what if you have two or three at the very top, so your H is very Right. So I'm going to show you an experiment like this. Um, so I'm, yeah. <laughs> OK, so I'm just going to show you two experiments. Um, so the first one, we have uh, 15 arms. So in this experiment, we have Bernoulli distributions everywhere. And the mean of the best arm, so the best arm is arm 1, and its mean is 0.5. Okay? So in the first experiment, which I call experiment 5, um, the, the mean goes down in, in an arithmetic progression. Okay? So you have 0.5 minus and then 0.025 times i. Okay, for i equals 2 to 15. And what I plot here, so the bars are the probability of error for different algorithms. And so the first one is just uniform sampling. So you see uniform sampling as, as the worst probability of error, as expected. It's the most naive algorithm. So in this problem, for instance, so n is 4,000. Uniform sampling will get you the right uh, arm uh, with probability at least 1 minus uh, 0.35, something like that. Then 2 to 4 were algorithms called Huffing races that appeared in the literature uh, previously. So they perform a little bit better than uniform, but not too much. Then bar 5 is this successive reject that I just told you about. Bar 6 to 9 are this UCB, uh, this finely tuned UCB. And the rest are the UCBE, where I try to estimate online H using a, a procedure which is non-trivial. Um, so you see successive reject does a better than, than all the other, I mean, than the previous strategies. It almost divides, like here, you see in, in this second experiment, the probability of error of uniform is close to 0.6, and the probability of successive reject is close to 0.2. Okay, so you can get real improvement. Um, so this second experiment, by the way, is, is what, you are, what you just talked about, right? So we have one good guy, which has a mean 0.5. Then we have uh, five guys which have a mean 0.45, so close by. Then another group at, at 0.43, and another third group. So this is three groups of, of bad arms. And here you see, with three groups of bad arms like this, it re it's really worth trying to adapt. So these algorithms, they will quickly remove all the very bad ones and focus on the good ones. Um, OK, so these, these are the numerical experiments. Now let me move on to uh, something else, which is what if instead of finding the best option, you want to find the M best? OK, so now maybe you want to find the five best arms instead of just the best one. So here I plot again the same two experiments. The name of experiment 7 changed to 6, but that's the same one. On the y-axis, I have the probability of error. And on the x-axis, I have how many arms do I want the algorithm to output. So the first point here, that corresponds to the previous slide. Okay, I just want to find the best one. Blue corresponds to uniform allocation. And at the end, I return the m best. Yes? Yes, at least one of them is one. So you are good only if you get the m correct. So that's not that's a difficult ordering task. Well. Ordering as well. Sorry? The ordering as well. No, 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 no. No, that's the key point. You don't care about the ordering. You just want to find the M best. Within the M best, you don't care about the ordering. Um, right. So so uniform is in blue and successive reject is in red. So as in the previous slide, red is much below blue. That's very good. But now look at what happens when you move m. And suddenly su successive reject, which was almost optimal for m equals 1, becomes really bad compared even to uniform. So what this is saying is, I mean, this was to be expected in some sense. But successive reject, because it was designed to find the best one, it has a very rough idea of the ranking below the best one, below the first two best. Like the other guys, he doesn't really know what's going on. So if you ask him to output the five best arms, it does a very bad job. Right? So what this says is that you fundamentally need to modify the algorithm when you want to find the m best. You cannot just do successive reject. Or actually, this is a variant of successive reject, where you don't have k. I mean, 
we, we rightly tune the number of phases and the, the samples per phases. So you need to modify it. So the modifications that we did with uh, two students um, is this green line, which is called successive accept and reject. So the key and only new idea of this paper um, is that when you want to find the M best, you not only reject bad guys, but you also need to stop sampling guys that look good. Because they look good, so now just stop sampling them and say, OK, this one is going to be in the batch that I accept. And that's it, right? So this is a successive accept and reject. Now, the difficulty is, at the end of a phase, how do you decide if in this phase you should accept someone or you should reject someone? So what you do is that you compare how confident, in some sense, you are about the acceptance and the rejection, and you do whatever is the best for you. And so the analysis is, is, is harder than for m equals 1, but you see, in practice, it really works, right? That's the green line. And here, for the other experiment, it, it really works. It's really better. And gap E is, is a variant. Um, all right, is there any question on this? Can you get it up? Can you get the, the, the screen up? Thanks. Um, OK, so is there any question on this? Yes. Why is So different from what? Uh, the, the other one, the SR. It's yes. Um, because when you try to accept the best guys, um, can you just treat it as the uh, invert problem, the negative problem of rejecting the name? So, but, so now you have two versions, but just but invert the negative Absolutely. Problem. The question is, where do you put the baseline? Right? You, where do you invert? Like, where do you put? You see, you see what I mean? Like, you, you say you want to take the negative. But, but when do you start taking the negative? So that's exactly the key point, right? So basically, the key is that if it, when you want to find the best one, let's assume that mu1 is larger than mu2, et cetera, up to mu k, then the new gaps that I define are so if you are in the best one if, one, if you are one of the best, then you look at the distance between mu i and mu m plus 1. So you, you look at the distance between mu and the first guy who is not in the M best. And conversely, for those who are not in the M best, you look at your distance to the last guy who is one of the M best. So you have those gaps. And what the algorithm does is that it estimates these gaps. And then it decides to accept or reject based on those gaps, those estimated gaps. But it's, it's along the lines of what you just said. And the complexity, what you can show is that in this case, the complexity is the sum of these guys one over this guy squared. So maybe just one open problem on this, and then I will spend 10 minutes on the other topic. One open problem is that here, we want to find the m best arms, but we put no structural assumption on the m best arms. What would be very interesting is, is the following more combinatorial problem, where assume that you have a graph, and, and the arms. So you have a graph, G, I don't know, like this, G on k edges. Right? So you have k edges. And on each edge, you have a priority distribution. And now what you want to find is maybe the best spanning tree. Okay, So find the best spanning tree. Right, so let's say that the spanning trees have a, a, a certain size m in this, in this example. So now we want to find a subset of size m of the k edges. But this subset also has to f satisfy some structural properties. So more generally, we are given a subset c of um, 2 to the k. Right? So it's a set of subset of 1 to k. And what you want is to find the argmax over, let's say, s in c of the sum over i in s of mu i. Right? So you want to find a, a, a subset of the arm with a certain combinatorial structure given by c, which maximizes the sum of, of, of the values within this. Um, 
I think this is completely open, and I don't think there is a general theory that will. I don't think there is a general algorithm that takes C as, as an input and then fi finds the best structure at the optimal rate. I think you need to, to have algorithm to really think hard for every single problem. The first one is the best planning tree. I don't know how to do it. You could try to think about finding the best matching. Let's say you have a bipartite, the complete bipartite graph. And what you want is to find the best perfect matching. I have no idea how to do that. Uh, I mean, you can go through the list of all combinatorial optimization problem and try to redo things in this stochastic framework with this point of view, right? With the point of view of optimal rates, optimal distribution dependent rate. Is uh, this problem known for the minimax? No. Uh, so the issue with the minimax is that more or less you, you gain only log factor. Here you get order of magnitude, right? You, you move from k over delta squared to h. So, but, but no, we don't know for minimax either. Oh, yeah, h or something would be basically summing over on the all spanning tree? No, it can't be. It's going to be much smaller than this. I mean, something trivial would be to view each spanning tree as an arm and then find the best, but, but that's exactly not what you want to do. But, but what you're saying is, is, is a trivial upper bound. And the key is that it's not going to be like this. So one thing that could be just how, how influential is this edge? So let's say you look at what is the best spanning tree that goes, that contains this edge versus the best spanning tree that does not contain this edge. If the gap between these two values is small, then maybe it says that this is, I mean, maybe it's, what, it's the sum of one over this gap squared. But I don't think so. I think there are other non-trivial uh, uh, correlations be between the edges. So I don't know what is the answer. Okay. So now I want to quickly talk about something else. So one nice thing about this theory is that I talked with quite a few people about practical problems and of discrete optimization and often they can be casted within this, this framework. But sometimes they can't and I will give you one example where you have to think to, to get something. So I have a set X. X is a countable set, but is known to me. And A is a subset of X. So think of X is a set of integers, and A is a set of prime numbers. Okay. So A is a set of interesting, interesting elements in some sense. But I don't know A, okay? I don't know A. And what I want is to discover A. I want to discover as many elements of A as possible. And so now I need to tell you how do I, how do I access these, these sets. So I access them through experts. So I have experts, which are probability distribution, new one up to new K. Probability supported on X. And now I can play the same game as before. So sequentially, I can make requests to this expert, to this probability distribution. When I make a request, I get a random variable drawn from the underlying probability distribution. And then I observe, did I get an interesting element or not? OK, so the game goes like this. So choose it in k, receive yt, which is drawn from new it. And I also observe whether or not yt is in A. So I observe the indicator that is it in A. And what I want is after n samples, I, I look at f of n, which is the number of interesting items that I found. So how many interesting items did I find? Well, I found these items, y1 up to yn. That's the set of items that I found. Which one were interesting? Well, it's the intersection with A. How many did I find? It's the cardinality of this thing. Okay. So now I want to maximize f of n. So I don't know a at all except when I when except I, when, when I, I receive, receive an interest. I'm told if it's, was if it's interesting or not. So does the model make sense? So imagine 
I have distribution on the integers. I don't know what are prime numbers. And, and I sample from one of the distribution. I get an integer. And then somebody tells me if it's a, a prime or not. Which is a more ah. realistic. Why? Yes. <laughs> now, now you, <laughs> now you yeah, want yeah, one. Yes. No, absolutely. So, I actually think that there are many, um, but, but I, I, I don't know yet many. <laughs> so I know one. Imagine that you have a big graph. It's it's really enormous. Let's say it's the electrical grid in the United States. Okay, and you have nodes, right? So the nodes are going to be your element in x. And now there are a few nodes in the, I mean, there are some nodes in this network which are faulty. Right? So there is something going on with this node. You actually need to physically go there and fix the node. What you can do is that given a node, you can run a security analysis and test whether or not, whether or not the node is faulty. And if it's faulty, you can go there and, 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 and fix it. But of course, you cannot run the security analysis for every node in the network. But then what you do is that you hire, you hire some engineers, and they think hard about the problem. And what they could come up with, maybe, are some kinds of random walks on these networks, which are biased towards 40 nodes. Maybe they, they are very smart. They were able to do that. So you have k of these engineers, and they each came up with their own heuristics. Okay? So you have k random walks. Uh, rather probability distribution on the network. And what you can do is you have only, let's say, you have only one computer that can run the security analysis. So every day you need to choose one of the key engineers, run his uh, or her uh, heuristic, and then run the security analysis, and then move on to the next day. OK? That, is this a good example? You could also have, I don't know, you want to. You, you, you have code for uh, uh, computer code, and you, have, you, you want to find all the bugs in your code. And you have different heuristics to find uh, elements of, of code that could be wrong. And you want to combine these heuristics in, in the best way. OK? Like online apps or other learning problems, right? You have apply different heuristics for showing people yeah. apps. Exactly. I mean, it's really about combination. Is that uh, equivalent to the previous problem with uh, Bernoulli? Exactly. Is it equivalent to the previous problem? So I don't think so, because the reason is that it, this is much more dynamic. So look at what happens if new one is a Dirac on an interesting item. So this guy, he gives me an interesting item. But he gives, he gives it to me only once, right? I mean, when I come back to him, he always gives me the same interesting item. So it's not interesting to, more, to me anymore. So this guy could be super good for one time step, and then bad forever. So there is this dynamical aspect that was not in the previous framework. But the FM, of FM, is the, uh, the set multi-set? No, no, no. It's a set. It's, it's, it's just a regular set. So meaning exactly is that if you see twice the same interesting item, it doesn't count twice. It counts only once. That's, that's where the difficult. If, if, if it wasn't like that, it would be exactly like the previous one. But because it counts only once, yeah, it's, it, exactly, it's discovery. You want to discover A. That's, that's the problem of, so we called it uh, optimal discovery with expert advice. So now what can you do? Well, so what would be the optimal? So imagine you knew the distribution UI. What would you do? What, what would be a simple thing to do? Well, if you knew the distribution UI, you could, for each distribution, estimate what is the probability that you will get an interesting item that you have not seen yet. Okay, so you could define this mi uh, quantities, which is the missing mass, which is the probability mass that new i puts on the set A, where you removed everything that you observed so far. So let's call this mi of t. Right. So if I knew what were a, what was A and new i, I could compute those things. And what I would do is just pull the argmax, I mean, go to the guy that maximizes this thing. But I don't know those, those mi of t. Right? But what I can do is that I can estimate them. So this is a famous problem. It's, this thing is a good Turing estimator. So it's, it's 
something very famous, uh, to, uh, to estimate the missing mass. So you can have an unbiased estimator of this guy, and you can even have concentration inequalities. And so what you do, the algorithm that we did, is that you sample this guy plus a confidence term, which is given by the deviations. So I'm going to uh, show you now um, some experiments that we did with this algorithm. So can I get the screen again? So is the algorithm sort of clear? So we, for each expert, we estimate the missing mass. And we add the confidence term, which is given by the deviations, uh, which you, you can derive. And so, so now this is an example. So, no. So that so the miss M I of T was if I knew the distribution, but then I can do the good Turing estimator, which does not require to know the the new I and the A. What you do is you just estimate for each. Experts, you estimate how many interesting items did I see exactly once in my sequence, and the normalized uh, this quantity normalized is an estimator, which is a good Turing estimator. So here I look at a problem where I have uh, seven experts. So the Qs, Q1 equals 51%, Q2 equals 25%, etc. That's the proportion of interesting items for each distribution. So expert one as a priority mass of 51% on the interesting items. Uh, the distribution are disjoint. And n is the overall size of the problem. So each distribution is uniform on a set of size 128 in this plot, 500 in this plot, 1,000 in this one, and 10,000 in this one. So I have distributions which are uniform on set of different uh, size, and they have a different proportion of these sets are interesting. And you see something is going on, right? You, you can see this convergence. So what I plot, sorry, what I plot is the number of interesting items that you found. So this is time, and this is the number of interesting items that you found. The top is this oracle strategy that plays the arms that maximizes the missing mass. This one is our algorithm, the second one. And this one is just uniform. You just allocate things uniformly. And you can see that we have a uniform convergence of the number of interesting items that we found for our strategy as the size of the problem grows. So that's what we called, we gave it the name of macroscopic uh, limit. So as the size of the problem grows, our strategy is uniformly optimal in time. So this is completely different from the multi arm bandit problem. So the multi arm bandit or the other one before was, I was looking at as n goes to infinity. Here, for any fixed n, as the problem size goes to infinity, I'm being optimal. So it's, it's a very different kind of limit. Uh, so this was for disjoint set of distribution. This one is, is the one with integers and prime numbers. And okay, it, gives, it gives the same, we, give, we obtain the same result. So we have a CRM and et cetera, but I don't have time to explain. And uh, so these are just some references that the 2012 10 paper uh, with the Laubron, that this optimal discovery, and that's the book with Nicolo Cesabianchi on multi arm bandit problem, if you want to know more about this. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I want, so, when you, uh, just in your, the first problem you described, yeah. so you had a Explain to us this uh, h over log k. Yes. Bound. Yeah. And then you said you could remove the log k that was changing the problem. Yes. But for the problem with the permutations? No idea how to do it. Okay, so the best bound is still with the yes. bound over log k. Yes. And then the, the other bound that you quoted from the current. Yeah, bound, yeah, yeah. So that bound. Was for which problem? Was the only shift one of them? Or no, so right. Or so so the upper bounds are assuming nothing. So the upper bounds are when you know nothing about the problem, and still you can you can adapt at the right rate. So so the upper bound holds for both setting if you want, uh -huh. right? And and somehow if you know the setting more, that doesn't lead to an improvement there. Well, what this theorem says is that at most it gives you an improvement in a log factor. But it could be, no, no, we don't know. It's an excellent question. Maybe, maybe with the log, it's tight. I mean, 
I don't think so, but uh, yeah, it would be nice to have a better proof for, for the case where you just have permutations. But yeah, the key trick was to change the problem so as to simplify the proof. That's, that, that was the point. Yes? So all the lower bounds in here are uh, the problem specific uh, lower bound, problem dependent lower bound. Yes. So have, can you say something about a problem uh, independent lower bound? Right. So the problem in the independent lower bounds are basically trivial. I mean, it's, it's immediate to get the optimal 1 over square root 10 rate. There is, there is nothing really interesting to do there. And that's why, despite the simplicity of the problem, it has not been really looked at in the past. It's because this, if you look at it from the simple point of view of minimax, it's not interesting. You have to do something else than minimax to make it interesting, basically. But people in practice have been looking at it, because in practice, it's, it, it's an interesting problem that, that people face. So. I'm not saying much about RN, huh? like, what, No, so what I want Yeah, yeah. So originally, so I can just tell you something, just one thing, which is this lower bound. Um, from actually even before, from 2009. If you look at the simple regret, right? So this was this thing that could go exponentially. This thing, I can lower bound it for any strategy by exponential minus a constant times the cumulative regret. So if, so optimal cumulative regret are of order log n. So if you are optimal for the cumulative regret, then you have a polynomial decay for the simple regret. So this lower bound, this was the start of the work because it says that it's a completely different problem minimizing the cumulative regret and the simple regret. If you try to optimize for the cumulative regret, you don't get optimal strategies for the simple regret. Um, yeah. But like, are there more to be good strategies for this R? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. R yes, 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 yes. So for the capital Rn, we know strategies which do capital Rn is smaller than it, some constant times log n. And and for small Rn, oh, you mean small Rn and not En? Is that, is that your point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. no. We don't know anything beyond applying those strategies. But I believe that those strategies are good for little Rn. I think those strategies are good for the simple regret. I just don't know how to do a better analysis than the trivial one. Because they don't give you anything if you have two k's at the top, huh? No. But you believe the algorithm is I think the, uh, yes. But, but I don't know how to prove something beyond Trivialities. I mean, you, you can say trivialities, but, but anything beyond, I don't know. Thank you.